Okay, it's blinking over there. I think we're getting ready. Okay, it says it says we're recording. We got one or two more people coming in. All right. Okay, so so did you really bring a Windows laptop to a Linux conference? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Windows is good stuff, right? I mean, we may prefer Linux, but you know, Sometimes you don't always have a choice. So what, my first self-conference, I, I probably came with my corporate laptop. And I was like, I can't load Linux on this thing, right? So my talk, that's the, I'm giving away the whole story. Uh, the, the talk is sometimes Linux is required. Sometimes it's, we're not comfortable yet. But I'm going to give you some tricks, to, uh, tips and tricks to get through that. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Sometimes, so the comment was sometimes your uh, your brand new laptops are not fully supported. So, uh, uh, and I want to talk about that too. So I'm Mark Ulmer, um, and again, this is a beginner talk. If you are uh, um, you know, com compiling from source and, and, uh, and contributing packages to Lakes, you're probably in the wrong room. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it, you know, when I looked at the talks, I didn't see a lot of beginners uh, sections. So I said, okay, well, you know what, I'm going to submit one. Um, so th this is some tips and tricks. Uh, I've got handouts at the end of the meeting. Um, there's some handouts on the... Um, the resources that I'm going to mention, and there's a slide that I will we'll leave up on the last slide. So, all right. When I was reviewing my slides, I said, you know what? I need to organize this in some way. One of my one of my colleagues in the Atlanta uh, Linux group said, why don't you address it, your audience? And so, the first set of slides are going to be to home users or students. And, um, and then after that, there's kind of like computer and Linux hobbyists that maybe, you know, spend a lot of time. Maybe you're retired, you, you, but you love Linux and, and you spend time on that. And then in the corporate world, maybe you're a sysadmin or a programmer. Uh, and again, you may not have the choice of what you get to use, but I, I have some tips there. All right. So I'm going to address them in stages and there's different backgrounds. So um, we'll, we'll approach it like that. So first of all, home, home users or students, you know, you may get this brand new laptop, desktop from Best Buy, uh, Walmart, wherever, and it comes with Windows. It comes with the Windows license. That's at least a $100 value uh, for, for a software license. And do you really want to just wipe that out? Um, maybe not. Maybe you're like, well, hold on a second. This is, you know, I just paid you know, several hundred dollars for this. Do I need to get rid of the windows just yet? And, and um, many people have talked about, you know, you can dual boot, and I, I've got some options there, but dual booting is risky too, right? What if you screw up that partition, right? What if you, what if you mess it up? So I've got a couple of little easier suggestions first. Maybe you're too unfamiliar with Linux that you're not ready to commit. So um, we've got some tips there. And, and frankly, uh, I've got to use both day to day. So I'm not always ready to, to uh, leave Windows. This brand new laptop I bought in, in uh, April, you know, I didn't want to just wipe the Windows out. So right now I'm dual booting. I actually did add a second SSD in there. And the Windows partition and such is all unadulterated. Un, uh, so. Um, Completely understand. This is this is why we're here, right? So, 
Your first option is to boot f uh, a live uh, Linux from USB. Um, you, you can flash a little thumb drive with, with Linux, um, and this will help you verify those drivers. So before you wipe out that Windows partition on that brand new laptop, you can test and see if that Wi-Fi 6 stuff works. If it doesn't, maybe you take it back. Um, but you can boot live and, and test out drivers. Um, you can also evaluate which distros uh, that you want to, you know, you, you listen to Mark. Mark may say Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Um, and, and you talk with, uh, you know, Charlie, he's going to be BSD, you know, and, and there'll be different options there. You may need to try those out and see which uh, one you like first. Um, all right. You can also boot multiple live distros. The, the latest tool, the hotness, is Ventoy. Um, and you can put on, on a little uh, thumb drive. Uh, I've got like multiple thumb drives here. Um, I'll show a screenshot here in a second. But I've got almost 20 distributions on this little uh, Ventoy uh, thumb drive. And, um, and that's a good option. Pin drive yet Linux is what existed before this, and uh, it's it's a very good tool. I still use that also, but Ventoy is the new hotness. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, when you, it basically puts an environment on your thumb drive, and then you just drag and drop ISOs to it. So on on this thumb drive uh, that I've got, I've got Kubuntu, Linux Mint. I know you can't see it from back there. Um, Linux Mint Cinnamon, Linux Mint Mate, uh, LUbuntu, MX Linux, Pop OS, um, uh, Ubuntu 22 Desktop, just the plain vanilla, and then I've got the live server, um, and we got Budgie, Ubuntu Budgie, Ubuntu Mate, and the list goes on. And I can try all those distros from that thumb drive. Uh, again, this is a way to not impact that Windows environment that's on your laptop. You can also, when you're ready to, and you found the distribution you want, you could boot and run from that USB for a while. Um, these two tools, and I don't know what the colors look like there, but um, uh, Etcher and Rufus uh, will actually allow you to set up persistent storage. And, and by the way, uh, I'm not promoting MX Linux, but MX Linux is one where I've had a lot of feedback from the, my Atlanta Linux users group. MX Linux works well running from USB. It'll store all the settings on the USB. It's portable. You can take it to multiple computers. And all your, you know, your browser favorites and your password uh, um, vault and everything's on there. And it's a, a way, another way to not impact that Windows environment that's on that new laptop or, or desktop. So consider those. Um, if you're going to run from a, a, a USB, uh, I want to make sure that, so make sure that you look for a good quality. Uh, you're going to want a USB 3.1 3 or higher uh, because it's faster, right? And if you get something like that, and you probably can't see it, but it's the one on the screen there, um, you know, you can find a low profile or a nano that won't stick out of the laptop very far. Basically, you can leave this attached all the time, and it's not going to get bunged and, and, and broken uh, off in the, in the hanging out the side of the laptop. So think about a little Nano one. This one's like $12, $13 on Amazon. Again, uh, you can find it, these things wherever you want, but go with a good name brand. Um, and, um, and again, remember, your persistent storage is, is possible. So if... Um, you know, and that doesn't hang out the, the laptop very far. All right, let's go to the next one. Here's another option, distrotest.net. Um, this guy spins up this uh, it's a website you go to, and you can just pick any one of the distributions that they host, and it, it'll provision a, a, a VM immediately, get it up and running, and then it gives you a, a VNC window that you can... Uh, test drive that Linux. And so, 
you know, it's free. The number of resources they give it, they're not going to give it a lot of RAM. It's going to be probably just enough to run. So your, your results may vary. But down there, that one looks like Windows. It's called Windows FX. And uh, this one you can run from, you can go check it out on, on DistroTestNet. Um, again, it, it runs in the browser. It'll give you a full uh, Windows FX environment. It is Linux. But look at that. They're using the Windows uh, 11 uh, wallpaper. The dock down at the bottom all looks as close as they've uh, been able to make it to Windows. This is if you just can't, if you just got to have Windows, but say, no, it's technically Linux, you can do that. It even has PowerShell. <laughs> so PowerShell is open source now, right? And, and uh, you can uh, see if your PowerShell runs on that. And so that's a, f that's a free resource. Again, your results may vary. So have any of y'all heard about this uh, site before? No, okay. And again, it's, it's listed on my resources at the end. Again, just a, a, a way to, if, if someone says, oh, you should try Debian or you should try Arch, but you don't want to change your laptop right now and distro hop, go give this a try. It's an option. All right, for the co computer and Linux hobbyist, uh, we're changing color screens here. We're going to go to the next section here. And I've got the, the, the tips are a little bit different, right? Um, the scenarios in this case may be um, you have custom requirements, right? Maybe there's a requirement that your wife needs to be able to use the computer with Windows, and you've got to boot for yourself uh, into Linux, um, and it's a shared computer, right? So um, you may have different requirements. You may be wanting to run on old hardware like, like uh, JP does out there with... Uh, uh, I don't know, some of this stuff you may not be able to do on old hardware, but you, know, you may have unique requirements in this area. One of the things I suggest is try remote desktop. So you know remote desktop is, is a Windows thing. Uh, well, you can install XRDP on Ubuntu. And then you can use the Windows remote desktop client, connect to it, and and you can tell it to take over full screen, and um, that's a good way to connect to a remote uh, Linux box. Um, I do this. I'm in security, and I've, I actually uh, run uh, Ubuntu on a cloud server uh, hosted, hosted somewhere, and um, then it, the IP address of that server is not my home. So if I'm doing any security uh, testing or uh, anything like that, it's coming from that address of some big data center somewhere, and it's not my home address. My connection is secured RD RDP. Um, and that way you can have a you know, full, full environment remote desktop. Uh, you can actually uh, have a lot of the same features that remote desktop has. You can uh, drag something from your Windows uh, desktop and drop it on Linux, and it'll put the file on the Linux desktop. Uh, it has the thin client drive mappings. Um, it takes a little bit more work, but you can also get your audio to pass through. All right. That's probably more of an advanced function. But so just remember, why, you know, just ask yourself, can I use RDP to access a remote box? And yes. From Linux, you can also RDP back to Windows, right? So this is a little bit different aspect. Uh, let's say you've got multiple computers at home, and one's the Windows for the wife, and one's your Linux box. Well, you know, every once in a while you need to use Windows, right? Well, you can remote desktop back. Now, of course, you can't do that with Windows Home, but Windows Pro and above, you can. So Ramina is the tool that comes in most Linux distributions, and you'll be able to connect back. Same type of thing, you'll be able to drag and drop, th drop things. Um, I actually have never tried um, uh, setting up audio from Linux to, to Windows, but. So Ramina's there and, and um, you can use that as your remote desktop client. <laughs> 
Okay, for a daily driver of, of either a desktop, meaning like a tower type of setup, or, or a laptop, um, one thing you may want to realize is that the latest hardware may not be fully supported in the drivers and the kernel, right? And so your situation, brand new laptop, didn't support Wi-Fi 6. I had issues with this laptop, this brand new, uh, this is an Asus. Um, and when I put on Linux uh, Mint Cinnamon, uh, which is, was that 20.3 is the latest version? Um, it, the, the, some of the drivers for the Wi-Fi, it, it wouldn't work, right? So I actually did install Ubuntu 2204. It has the latest Linux kernel. I think we're at 5.15 that I had to be above, and that enabled the Wi-Fi to work. Um, might, might have been your situation there too. But Linux Mint doesn't support 5.15. Even if you go with their, um, they have a, uh, like the latest kernel thing, I think it only goes up to 5.13. So I couldn't use um, Linux Mint Cinnamon, which is, is kind of my go-to, but, um, but the latest Ubuntu work fine. So realize you may have driver issues. Now, often if you're looking at a, a equipment that's one to two years older model, let's say you don't go with a 2022 uh, or 21 model, if you're looking at a 2019 laptop that they still are selling new on, on some place, um, that architecture may be well supported on the mainstream uh, distributions. So uh, just keep that in mind. Basically, the whole story is, and, and I'm not a kernel guy, but it's my understanding that you know new things come out like Wi-Fi 6, it's gonna take a little while for the kernel to uh, the kernel org to put that in and, and then it'll take a little bit longer, f uh, you know, a little bit later, the distributions will adopt that kernel and then it will become in the mainstream builds. All right. For a daily driver, um, and, and again, we're in that computer and, and Linux hobbyist type of situation, I'm gonna suggest that you may wanna try Ubuntu or, or Linux Mint. It's gonna be beginner friendly. And this is not just Mark, well, it's, sort of, it's Mark telling you, but again, I participate every week in the Atlanta Linux users group and feedback over the years, Linux Mint is probably one of the, the most uh, user friendly to start with. Beginner friendly, I should say. Arch or Fedora, you may, what about Arch? You know what? <laughs> Beginners can get themselves into trouble with if you don't understand the packaging and such. Um, so um, you may need to ask for more help or, or be more advanced for that. I know, I, I know I'm not that good in, in that area yet. So um, just be cautious. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm saying, you know, try it from a, you know, a boot USB. Check those things out first. See if, make sure that you're, you know, comfortable with it. All right, most people are on a budget. You say, what, what can I do? I can't afford you know, a $700 laptop. Well, you know what? Um, five to eight-year-old equipment, we found uh, through, through my user group, five to eight-year-old, even up to 12-year-old equipment works just fine. You can get a, a, a corporate refurbished uh, laptop like a Lenovo or something through, through eBay or, or, or through Amazon. Um, uh, not the marketplace, but you know, there's sellers that will sell uh, uh, factory refurbished uh, laptops and stuff. Things that have, uh, sometimes they call it off lease. Um, that equipment works fine. You may not have the best of, you know, it's not gonna be the best gaming, but it could be a very solid um, um, laptop. You know, corporate laptops are made so they can be dropped. <laughs> no. A little bit more resilient. Um, but one thing, my recommendation here is look at the Passmark. Passmark is a CPU benchmark um, and it, it's based upon your CPU model number. So if you have an Intel or, or AMD Ryzen 2 5500, 
Go and Google Passmark Ryzen 5, uh, Ryzen 2 5500, something along those lines, and it'll give you a number. If that number's below 1200, and this is, this is Mark's guesstimate thing, you know what? I wouldn't bother. I'd, st I'd stay away from it. It may be too slow for you. You can still do it. You're ju you just may not be happy with the performance. All right? If you're somewhere in the 1200 to 1500 and, and above range, you may want to try LUbuntu. Okay, it's a Linux flavor with a lightweight desktop. It runs LXQT or XFCE. Again, is a XFCE is a great lightweight um, uh, desktop. These have been known to be very performant. It's not going to be as much of a memory hog. Um, and uh, and then if you're over 2,500, you probably, you, you may be up in the range a lot higher than that. Uh, you probably have a gaming laptop. Gnome and Cinnamon are going to work just fine on those. Uh, and, and, and you'll be happy. Gnome and, and Linux Mint Cinnamon. So the higher the pass mark, the better. Again, you can Google all this. Uh, the link will be in the show notes. Uh, it's a CPU benchmark. Um, and then... On these, on these uh, off-lease laptops or, or used laptops that you may find, if it's got a traditional sp spinning rusty drive, um, you may want to replace that with a SSD. That's going to be my best advice for you. If you've got an old laptop, put it in an SSD. It'll bring, it'll bring new life. Uh, I've, even, I've even used um, old 2015 MacBooks. Put an SSD in there, reload the OS, and I mean, just it makes a world of difference. Um, so consider now. Of course, that takes some hardware um, knowledge. But so on a budget, shouldn't be a problem. In fact, Linux is going to run much even uh, better and more performant than Windows. Um, you'll be happy with that. What about a Raspberry Pi? Well, Raspberry Pis are cheap, right? And um, I can get Raspberry Pi with, with two, four, or eight uh, gigs of RAM. No, you can't. They're not available right now. <laughs> but Raspberry Pis are great little hobbyist. Uh, again, we're in the hobby section. Raspberry Pis are great little uh, hobby computer. By the way, the pass mark's 1834. And, um, and these things are great. Uh, Nate's going to love it. Look, I brought my... Raspberry Pi 400. Yeah, so it's a keyboard for the video there. We got it. So uh, it's a keyboard integrated with a Raspberry Pi. It's got a huge heat sink underneath. Um, and, and these little things are great. This will run Ubuntu uh, GNOME just fine. Here's the Raspberry Pi imager. You can go in there and it specifically calls out, okay, Ubuntu desktop, Raspberry Pi 400. And, the, and then you can flash a little uh, SD card. Um, this guy you can find right now. And uh, this one is, uh, if you get just the computer, just this piece, it's 70 bucks. And you can find them at Micro Center, um, find them online. There's a kit for 100 that comes with the mouse and the power cable and all that. You're going to need power cable uh, and video cable and all that. But... Uh, Something to consider, you know, I'm not going to use this as a daily driver. Keyboard's too small, my, I, my number, my fingers are too fat, and I don't like the, uh, I like having a full number pad. But there's a Raspberry Pi 400. All right. Pass mark is 1834, so that puts it in that area where I kind of say, well, maybe it's better to run a lightweight. Um, and then remember, you're not going to, on something like that, something that has limited RAM, if you're hoping to get 20, 30 browser tabs open, which all consume memory, you're not going to be happy. Get a, get a full laptop with a lot of RAM, right? All right, what about, what about running virtual machines? Yeah, absolutely. Virtual machines are an option, right? In Windows, you can get 
uh, VirtualBox or, or VMware player, and you can install Linux in the virtual machine, access it when you want. Uh, that's absolutely an option. We've been doing that for years, right? And, and some people like it. You can even tell it take over the whole screen, right? Um, you, you, you plug in USBs, the stuff will pass through and it just works fine. Uh, there are some limitations, right? If, you're, um, if you want to do security testing like I do and you run Kali in a, in a VM, you know, you may not be able to put that NIC in promiscuous mode, right? There, there's going to be things you may not be able to do. Um, I can't remember, you know, you may have issues setting up multiple, um, uh, multiple displays, uh, getting the networking just like you want it. Just know your re results may vary. In a corporate environment, will they let you do that? Sometimes, sometimes not, right? <laughs> you have to ask. And that's, that goes into this next section. Oh, the other thing is remember that uh, the guest editions for um, VirtualBox are technically, they're not free. They are proprietary drivers, uh, but, but so is third-party drivers for Ubuntu. Um, just remember, though, that, that you, know, you need to be cautious of the license in that area. All right, and, and when you are ready to put on the tux, then you finally do your direct install, right? And again, maybe you're gonna dual boot because you still wanna keep that Windows and have the best of both worlds, uh, but you'll need to go look up the dual booting. And we've been talking about dual booting for a decade with, with Linux and Windows, right? So there's plenty of videos on how to do that. Um, like I said, this brand new laptop came with the SSD. Um, 2232, I think, is like only like that big. But there was another slot for another NVMe SSD. And I just, I bought an extra one, plugged it in there, and that's where the Linux went. So I didn't impact the, um, uh, the Windows uh, SSD at all. All right, so now we're segueing into corporate sysadmins and programmers. So... Again, the scenario might be that your work provided you a laptop uh, or you've got a desktop from corporate and you're sitting at the desk and they don't just want you installing anything. Um, you get the corporate Windows image, it's maybe locked down and you don't have options, right? So what you can do is you can SSH to a remote machine. Um, another, another option is Ubuntu is available in the Microsoft Store now. This is the Linux, uh, sorry, the Windows Services for Linux. Oh, I tried to, to say that too fast. Um, you can get this from the Microsoft Store. So maybe you ask your corporate environment, "Hey, can I get Ubuntu from Microsoft?" And they may say, "Yes." You just have to make the request, right? A um, couple of points for this. Well, if you give me this, I don't need to use Putty anymore. I can do all my SSHing from here and I can store my keys. Um, if I get this out of the Microsoft Store, I don't need VMware Player or, or VirtualBox anymore. I don't need WinSCP. I basically have all those tools in the Ubuntu CLI. This is a CLI. It, it is not for GUI applications. Um, for Windows 11, you can. That's the next slide. Very good. <laughs> For Windows 11, you can add GUI ability. Uh, I have not tested this. Well, actually, I did, but I couldn't get it working. So, <laughs> so it's untested. So, so the comment for, yeah. So the comment for online was uh, the gentleman in the audience has a, a, a Surface Pro, and yes, there are limitations. Uh, if if there's any uh, credential prompting and such, 
uh, it may not pass through to Windows properly. And, and so, yeah, your, your GUI applications that don't require uh, those types of things may run fine, but then, again, there's going to be scenarios that may not fit the working uh, part. Go ahead. That's right. Okay. Okay. So, so the comment for the for the online folks is, um, uh, X Wayland apps are supported well. X Classic may not work very well. Uh, again, it depends upon uh, how well it's been tested. Right. All right. So the comment was about MOBA XTERM having a, a X server um, in Windows. And yeah, that's a great tool. I, I love MOBA XTERM. I, I pay for it annually and uh, I, I use it a lot. And, and it will allow uh, X window applications to work just fine. Let me go back a slide. Was that all? So let me show you what this looks like. Um, by the way, Ubuntu CLI under, under Windows, the Ubuntu user and password, it'll, it'll ask you to set that at the beginning. Uh, and so it is not the same as your Windows user. So you're going to have to set up. I, I keep the same name, either Mark on my personal or, or M. Ulmer on my corporate. And then, um, uh, and then I set the password. The password's not the same either. So user and password are completely separate. Uh, you decide what you want to do on that. But just know that it's not the same user. The paths are important. So you, the Unix home folder is not the same as the Unix home folder on Windows. Um, did I say that right? Let me say it again. The Linux user home is not the same as the Windows home in where your user is. And so just keep that in mind. But you can find it. If you go to mount C typical users slash mark, okay, there's all my Windows files. And I'm looking at that from the command prompt. Um, one thing I like to do, and here's my tip, is set up a symbolic link uh, to your downloads folder and your documents. So from, from the Linux side, I, I run this command, um, and it creates a, a link folder of documents or downloads and it's pointing to the mount point on the windows. And, um, and then that way, when I, when I um, download something in my windows browser and I just CD into, into downloads, the files there, if it's a, if it's a tar gzip, I can, I can untar it on Linux. On windows, if it's a, if it's a zip, I can just right click and, and uh, uh, extract it. Um, and, and basically, I can go back and forth. If, if I'm on Linux, I can use YouTube Downloader and download something in my downloads. And then I go over to Windows, and I just double click the file, and it plays. Right. So a little bit of best of both worlds. Here's what it looks like. Uh, you know, it's just a CLI. But you can see I've got my, my uh, folders mounted there. And uh, that's just a tip to try to, again, help you interact and maybe not be I could never remember where that mount drive was so I finally ended up uh, linking to it and that that made it all better for me this is by the way this is a great SSH client um, your keys can go into you 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 run SSH key gen it'll create the dot uh, SSH folder which is a hidden folder put the right permissions on it and you can go in there, you can see your keys, you can create new keys. Um, and uh, I never liked the putty key gen thing that was uh, the, like this extra tool that you had to get out of putty and go mess with the keys and then come back to putty and put the key in. I like this just so much better. Um, you can work with the config file. SSH has a standard config and, and um, the you can look up the syntax on that but you can basically set up a little profile my profile here is called Plex and the host name of my Plex server is Ubuntu server Plex my user is mark my key file is is in my uh, my identity file is in the dot uh, SSH 
I can set all those things up, and then my shortcut, all I have to do is type in SSH Plex. And then it says, oh, I know what you're looking for. You're looking for this host with this user using this key. And if you're not doing that today in, in your just Linux stuff, I hope I, hope I uh, uh, tell you to <laughs> go check that out. Was there a question over here? I'm sorry. OK. Uh, but yet, so all that stuff you can do on, on Ubuntu CLI, I think it's a great SSH client. Now, if you only need SSH, someone may say, well, I can get SSH and PowerShell. Yes, that is available now. But you know what? And, and your corporate team may say, no, if you want SSH, you don't no longer, we're going to give you PuTTY, you can't have Ubuntu. They say, use PowerShell. Well, you know what? Not everything's available. In fact, SSH copy ID isn't there, or I haven't found it. So keep that in mind. You're going to be asking your corporate environment, hey, can I have that Ubuntu CLI? Because I can do all this fancy CLI stuff. Um, it's going to be most compatible, your configs, with Linux and your server Linuxes and, and all that. Um, in, the, in the Ubuntu CLI, you'll be able to install Python. Um, where's, the, where's the screen? You can install Python and write programs here. You're in a Linux environment, so when you actually port that over to your server, it should just run the same. So I, I think this is a great option on Windows to have the Ubuntu CLI. This is really what started my talk I wanted to talk about today. And um, I use this all the time. I even, uh, in my in my day-to-day -day job, um, I connect to Google Cloud. The GCloud client is is all available in there. You just install it, and and I'm running GCloud authentication and all that, and, and it all just works just great. Um, all right, let's see where we're at. Am I going the right way? I'm going the wrong way. Okay. But the PowerShell SSH, yeah, it's there. I, I, I haven't uh, really found that uh, I use it that much. Now, while I've been talking about the Ubuntu CLI, there are other options. You can get Debian and Kali Linux and a number of others. So look for those in the Microsoft Store also. Um, again, they're all going to be basically the same type of thing. A, a Linux CLI only, uh, but those are there. Kali Linux will come with some tools. Uh, again, you may not be able to put it in promiscuous mode if, if Microsoft doesn't allow you putting the, the NIC in promiscuous mode, but you, you'll be able to try some of the tools. Again, nothing GUI. Maybe, maybe in Windows 11, maybe. <laughs> And then don't forget to patch. So I'm a security guy. Even the Ubuntu CLI that comes from the Microsoft Store, you need to patch. So run a uh, sudo apt, uh, apt, get, uh, apt update and upgrade often. Um, you do need to keep that patch too. All right, uh, some resources. So we're getting towards the end of the talk. Uh, I'm part of one of the, I'm one of the organizers for the Atlanta Linux enthusiasts. Um, you know, since COVID, we've been online, and and for uh, as long as I can remember, we've been meeting every Sunday from three to six Eastern. Um, you're welcome to join us. We 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 had a couple of in-person meetings, but we decided to also continue the online. Um, go to ale.org. The meeting information's there. You click on the Jitsi link and join us. Uh, this is, there's no presentations typically scheduled. You're welcome to just join and ask for help. Now, you need to manage your own help request, right? So if we're in there talking, uh, we try not to talk politics, but if we get off on a different topic, um, you say, hey, I'm here to get help with, and let's talk about Linux, right? And open source software and your application. There you go. <laughs> um, 
Uh, this is this is really old. <laughs> uh, the web, our our website is not well maintained, but but the but the meeting is always posted and it's up at the top. Um, but so you not you may not find a lot of current information, but you'll at least find our meeting. All right. Um, we used to eat pizza, but again, we've, we're online, so we're not meeting uh, meeting too often. Um, but you're welcome, you know, with COVID and we've all gone online, you're welcome to join us. And I, I tell you, seek out other Linux groups. Um, in the audience, we have Cubicle Nate, who does a Linux saloon on Saturday evenings. Uh, I, I joined that and uh, part of a panel where we talk about various Linux, uh, and, and sometimes it's about news, sometimes it's about a... Uh, uh, evaluating a distro uh, and then and then in the after show you can sometimes ask questions um, Linux is uh, uh, Nate participates in a lot of th uh, Linux shows uh, and in things online um, I'll mention uh, this week in Linux uh, with the Linux destination network uh, destination Linux network DLN um, check that out again as a beginner, you may need to ask for help. And I'm saying there's these things that are available all the time, weekly. I'm here, I'm here on this channel uh, three to six every week, and, and you can ask for help. Um, there's a group of folks. We're not always, we're not experts, but we'll try to help you out. Some of the biggest things that uh, we find that, that uh, people need help with is getting Pulse Audio configured. So we do that a lot. Yeah, and yeah, PipeWire is probably better. Um, okay, DistroWatch. If you haven't heard about DistroWatch, you, you need to check it out, right? This is, for, for many years, this has been the place to go to to check out uh, what's happening with Linux. Um, each, each distribution is listed. There's a, there's a popularity index on there, but realize that popularity is about downloading uh, through their, uh, clicking on links through their site. So. Um, while, while something may be very top, uh, it, it may not be true representation of popularity, but it, it's an indicator. Um, so keep in mind DistroWatch. A lot of people will join and ask about, uh, about training. Where can I get Linux training? And um, for a beginner, I'm going to suggest this site, Linux Journey. You may have a little bit of Linux. Well, this will help you take it to the next level. Uh, it's very simple. This is not a certification website or, or, or any type of course. It's just some little widgets that are, are a JavaScript quiz and such, and I think they'll really help you out. So check, check that out. It's called Linux Journey, um, and it, it may just help you get your skills to the next level. Um, if you don't know how to use VI, there's some tips on there. It'll, 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 um, it'll uh, teach you a little bit of how to use that, rather than going through the Vim Tutor yourself. Um, so this is one that we in the in our uh, Linux users group mentioned a lot. There was a question in the back. Comment? No. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So the comment for online was, if if you see on DistroWatch, there may not be a a, a distribution that you want to see on the on DistroWatch. You can always just download it and try it yourself. Absolutely. Um, I know on our on our some of the Linux stuff I've done done uh, Peppermint OS is is um, uh, there's a couple of gentlemen that really like Peppermint. I I think it's a be very beautiful desktop and. Uh, uh, it's got a unique way of doing things, and, and in the setup, you have to add the software you want. It just doesn't assume you want those things. And uh, yeah, check, check those things out. Um, all right. Another, uh, another resource is the Linux Upskill Challenge. This is a 30-day, um, and it's published on GitHub. It's a 30-day challenge to you. Day zero is you need to get a VM going for Linux. You can use your you, you can use your um, uh, virtual box or you can use uh, a, a cloud hoster. 
there's a couple of different uh, options there, like three or four options. You can go DigitalOcean or Vulture and get a get a, a Linux um, virtual machine. You can set it up at home. But day zero, you got to get your got to get a VM planned. And then each day, it's only about an hour or two. And some of those don't even take an hour. This is like max hour. Uh, there'll be a challenge for that day, and you just spend some time to try to go through it and 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 get through the uh, the instruction. You go ahead. No, for beginners. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, and and uh, I did day. Uh, I have not done the full challenge, but um, I did some of the some of the first days. And yes, yeah, some of it is just. Go explore the file system and go find this, right? And it didn't, for me, that had a little bit more intermediate experience, um, I was able to knock it out in 15 minutes, right? But have, have a look at this. Recently, so it was a GitHub, and there was a gentleman that forked it and also did um, complimentary videos for every day. So now there's also a video that'll walk you through the steps and he'll talk about it. So um, I think that's a great enhancement because the original GitHub was just text and, and now there's videos too. Um, this link will get you to that. And uh, it sets up, every, there's also a Discord channel where you can help uh, ask for help. And it starts at the first, uh, on the first of the month, every month. and you can basically walk through there and say, hey, okay, you know, t uh, today's June, whatever, and I'm on, you know, Upskill Challenge 9. Right. All right, thank you. That was my talk. Um, here's those reference links. You can snap a picture. There's handouts up here if you want to uh, grab one with all the links, and I'm open for questions. I'm not an expert, but I wanted to give a talk, you know, to give you some ideas. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yep. But I would suggest you work it the other way around. Install Linux. Install all the apps that you can run natively under Linux that replace your Windows apps. But then you've got that accounting app that it only runs under Windows. So you go ahead and you run KVM or VMware running your Windows instance as a virtual machine, firing it up only when you need it. It's faster than a dual boot. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. So for the comment for online was, why don't you run Windows in a VM on, on, on one of the hypervisors and, and have Linux as your primary. And yeah, that's absolutely a great option. And you, you'll, you'll be able to then, when you need that very specific Windows app that only runs in Windows, you fire up that VM and get that. That's absolutely an option, right? Or again, depending upon your scenario, maybe the wife's got the Windows laptop and you've got the, the Linux laptop. Well, you RDP over to hers and use that app, right? So, um, yep, all of those things are possible. Yes, sir. So, when you're talking about finding uh, used hardware, one place I would urge people to go look is Cramden Institute. Cramden Institute for used hardware. Okay. That's great. And so that's the, their approach with that brand. I, they use the, by selling the hardware, that's how they fund their operation. Okay. And what's the name of the organization? Cramden Institute. Okay. So for online, Cramden Institute has got used hardware. Um, you can purchase that. That actually goes to funding free computers for, for low income and such. Uh, check that out. I don't know the details, but it was mentioned in the audience. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yep. What does the bench do differently? So, that's right. So, 
So the question about Rufus, Rufus is writing an ISO one to the disk. Um, and, and Ventoy is setting up more of an environment for you to run ISOs. So you, you, format, the, uh, you format the flash drive with, with Ventoy, and that's basically the operating system for the flash drive. And then you just drag and drop ISOs. And, and so you can have multiple ISOs on there now, and, uh, and then you pick it from the boot menu. Uh, it's kind of like, okay, dare I say it, grub for a USB. And, and, but the entire environment's on there. And then you just drag and drop the ISOs in there. Um, Yeah, right, it doesn't extract the ISOs, it just leaves them like they are. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. That's right. Yeah. So the comment on Ventoy is, is that it doesn't have to be just Linux. If it's an ISO, like the, the Windows 11 ISO, you can boot that too. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Distribution That's right. That's right. So since DVD players are not available on laptops anymore, we had to we have to go to thumb drives. But thumb drives, um, you just have it's just all those various ISO images of uh, of the Linux. So I hope that helped you. Yeah. One more comment. Yeah, so, so the comment for online is there are other remote desktop uh, applications. No machine, there's also, um, oh, gee, there, there, there's several others, and those work just, just great too. They'll set up and redirect the audio, um, and boy, I can't think of the other ones I've used before. Throw some out there. Um, okay. Yep. 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 Uh, team Team Viewer is one of the other. Yeah. But that one's. I don't think that one's uh, free. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mobile Extra may be able to do stuff with with X Windows. And, and the whole goal is, is you know, you, you got your safety net there on, on Windows, but you, have, you use these other uh, utilities and such to get yourself into the Linux world and get more familiar with it so uh, you, you can eventually make the switch. Yes, sir. Okay, so the comment was uh, in Charlotte. There's a there's a place called the Grid, and they sell used laptops. Um, it's a oh, it's a Goodwill store. It's a Goodwill for electronics. Uh, yep, and uh, and and so in your in your city, many times there's uh, one location that gets all the Goodwill electronics. Uh, uh, look for that, and um, I know in, in the city I previously lived, they had the similar type of thing. You can always find. Uh, neat unique you know pieces of equipment that may not be available anymore so um, all right and don't forget to patch every one of you need to patch today by the end of the day or when you get home <laughs> so all right these these uh, sheets up here have the links if you want to grab it and go ahead another comment
Is that, is that uh, uh, Georgia, Athens, Georgia? Okay, so the organization is called Free IT Athens, um, and the comment was that they also have um, uh, equipment they donate. Okay, and that it'll come with de desktops and laptops with Ubuntu. Uh, so that's something someone mentioned in here. Yes, sir. That's right, and there there is WSL two. Um, so when you're setting up, uh, you know that Ubuntu CLI is going to say you need Windows services for Linux. It is in the uh, additional features or optional features, and you will need to turn that on. And you'll want to if if it tells you do you want WSL one or two, you want two. Um, And so Windows 10 has got WSL2, you have to download it, but Windows 11, I think, comes with a default. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and that's the part I couldn't get working on, uh, on mine. So the okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. Please hit the vote buttons on the way out. Thank you. Hit the vote buttons on the way out, please whether it was good or bad or neutral, either way. <laughs>